Hello and welcome! My name is Wombat and last week I got just 24 hours hands-on with the new Panasonic Lumix GH6. But who am I? What's it like to use this camera and more importantly, what can the camera do? Let's start with the final question as we fade into some obligatory B-roll. Hopefully you enjoyed that. For the rest of this review, we're going to start with the basics, then we're going to move into the review, which I've split into three main sections, the technical, video, and photography. After that, we have a conclusion along with a quick summary. You can skip to any of those points using the time codes in the description or hopefully appearing in the bar down below. So who am I? I've been in the film and TV industry for about the last 10 years. I started out as an actor and then trained and certified as a stunt performer. However, in the last couple of years I've migrated and restudied to work on the crew side of productions. I work as an independent videographer, using different cameras on many types of shoots. I also run this YouTube channel which typically covers gaming news and gaming reviews. If you're interested, you should check it out, and yes, that is a plug. So, why am I starting camera reviews, you might ask? Well, the simple truth is that I love cameras, and any excuse to shoot and use more of them is fine by me. I should also point out that my default or everyday shooter is the Panasonic GH6's predecessor, the Panasonic GH5, what we're shooting on right now. But speaking of the devil, let's have a look at the GH6. The basics. The GH6 costs just over three and a half thousand Australian dollars. It has a micro four thirds or MFT sensor, which basically means it falls about here on the scale compared to a full frame sensor, and it natively takes micro four thirds lenses. It's got Panasonic's new Venus engine, which we'll explore a little more in the technical section of this review. It's advertised with autofocus, dual ISO, 5.7K ProRes video, and HD video up to 300 frames per second, although I had a little trouble when it came to that one. But how well do these words actually translate to the real world? The technical. Part one, the sensor. Panasonic say the sensor on the GH6 is the biggest micro four thirds sensor ever fitted to a camera. And at 25.2 megapixels, it looks like they're right. A bigger sensor means more light, more data, and more pixels for your captured frames. Bigger than any other micro four thirds sensor it may be, it's worth keeping in mind that the camera is still micro four thirds, meaning once again, it fits about here on the scale of a full frame camera. The camera itself has a dynamic range of 13 stops, the same as its predecessor, the GH5, and a number of other cameras out there on today's market. Something that does stand out is the camera's dual ISO, something that is becoming more and more common, but isn't commonplace yet, and I cannot stress how much of a good feature this is. The GH6's dual ISOs are 802,000, allowing it to utilize those 13 stops of dynamic range over a much wider gamut. The camera also takes advantage of Panasonic's V-Log color profile in both stills and moving images, which I personally loved working with. But we'll touch more on those sensors a little bit later as we get into stills and video individually. It's safe to say Panasonic did a fantastic job with its new sensor, and it may just be my favorite micro four thirds sensor of all time. But how well is it utilized? Part two, the processor. The processor on a camera is responsible for dealing with everything from the sensor to the memory card. So everything from the resolution of your photos and videos to your in-body stabilization and even your autofocus. If it's an advertised function, odds are it's part of the processor. Panasonic claimed the new Venus engine processor in the GH6 triples the speed of autofocus and has twice the processing power, though they don't specify a comparison or reference point for either of those statements. Moving on, images from the GH6 cap out at 5776 by 4336, while video maxes out at an impressive 5.7K, or roughly the same size as those images. 
We'll touch more on those as we get to those individual sections, but for now let's move on. The camera has fairly solid in-body stabilization. It's certainly very usable when combined with Lumix Lens's inbuilt optical image stabilization system. My god, that is a mouthful. And even with that in mind, I didn't find it too power draining. I got about four to five hours of on-off shooting with the camera. However, with only 24 hours hands-on, I didn't have time to do a continuous shooting test, so your mileage may and definitely will vary. However, it's when we get to the autofocus that this system really starts to let you down. The autofocus had a few options, so I set mine to human, because that's the subject I was trying to get in focus most of the time, and in short, it was terrible. Day and night it hunted and hunted to find the target, and even when it identified it, the focus was usually off. I ended up setting my prime f1.7 lens to almost f4 to compensate for the autofocus's ineptability, at which point I thought, well why did I bother with the money for a prime lens, I could have got almost the same shot off a kit lens for much less money. But looking at technical specs will only get us so far, let's see what the camera's like in the real world. Video. Putting aside that the autofocus was about as helpful as landfill, the camera really performed when I took it out into the real world. Whilst capable of shooting 4K and even 5.7K footage, I stuck the camera at 1080p, A to try help out the autofocus, but primarily because I wanted to take advantage of 240 frames per second recording, whereas 4K would have capped me at 60 frames a second and 5.7K would have capped me at a measly 30. You might have noticed that I said 300 frames per second earlier, which is what Panasonic advertises, but only 240 just now. I was unable to find a combination of settings that allowed me to bring the camera up to 300 frames a second, though given that I only had 24 hours with it, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt that a series of settings that I didn't get around to testing is what was needed. Shooting in vlog, I thought the camera did a fantastic job at keeping details, range and colour. I think it's worth noting that some people are critical of how sharp digital cameras can be, but personally I love this look, and if you're not of the same opinion you can always soften this up a little in post-production. The footage was bit rich, easy to edit, and, when in focus, really simple to shoot. Despite being a micro four thirds sensor, I never felt limited by either the depth of field or the narrowness of the lenses. I was able to capture whatever it is I needed. During the day, I was notably impressed with how well the camera kept details in the shadows, something many cameras struggle with, especially in the year-round harsh Australian sunlight. At night, well, it's a micro four thirds. If you play it smart, you bring along some external lighting, you'll be fine. But if you're out with nothing but your camera and a couple of lenses, you're just not going to have a good time. As impressive as the sensor is, it's simply not big enough to allow for the amount of light that needs to hit the sensor for details in low light images. In short, you can expect a lot of grain in your shots. If like me, you enjoy lowering the mid-tones in the shadows, you'll probably find the footage is pretty workable. Also, keep in mind, YouTube does a fantastic job of filtering out grain, so the footage you're seeing probably looks a lot cleaner than it did on my end. Conversely, if you have the know-how and the time, you can probably do a pretty good job of cleaning up the shots yourself. The bottom line is there simply isn't enough room on the MFT sensor to pick up large quantities of light that the sensor requires for clean shots once the sun goes down. At least, not in motion. Photos. Photos, or stills on the other hand, was an entirely different story. Whether it was day or night, I was completely blown away at the images captured. The GH6 shoots great shots. It's that simple. The GH6 shoots great shots. The GH6 shoots great shots. Try that six times fast. No? Just me? In low light, I shot up as high as 12,800 ISO, something I've never seriously done on a shoot before. And honestly, I was blown away at the quality of the images. For reference, I'm normally the type of person who won't shoot two stops above native, if I move off native at all. With this camera, I ended up just leaving the ISO on auto with no upper limit, and I wasn't disappointed with a single image. Well, I mean, outside of losing them to autofocus. I love the colour science behind the vlog capture, I love the sharpness of the image, I loved editing the work and really seeing my visions take shape. The images from the camera were easily my favourite aspect of the GH6, and I really wish I could take the sensor out of that camera and put it into my GH5. Conclusion. Here's the thing. While I'd love to take the sensor out of the GH6 and put it in my GH5, I wouldn't replace my GH5 with the GH6. There are a couple of reasons behind this, and the first is that while the footage impressed me to no end, the user experience did not. As I've mentioned, the autofocus was absolutely horrible, and in truth it's actually worse than the GH5, not to mention any camera that I've used. But I also didn't like physically interacting with it. Now to be clear, this comes down to personal preference. But on my GH5 and a lot of other cameras I've played with, there's a nice sort of mechanical interaction as you go with it. So you know when you're half pressing, for instance the shutter so you get focused without starting to roll or getting a photo, and you know when you've pushed any other buttons because you feel that mechanical impulse pushing back. The GH6 however is completely digital. You don't know if you've pressed a button, and I would constantly find myself trying to get focused by half pressing the shutter, 
And what would happen is it would simply start rolling or take a shot or end rolling. So I was constantly losing or ruining takes without knowing it, thinking I was just hunting for focus or getting ready to end my shot. And finally, the price. I mentioned at the start of this review that the GH6 cost just over three and a half thousand Australian dollars. For reference, I bought my GH5 earlier this year for just $1,100, and I got that with five extra batteries and a 25mm prime lens. Whilst you might argue that it's not fair to put a second-hand price against a brand new one, I'd argue that if you're looking for a camera considering the GH lineup, you're not going to buy a GH5 new. This means that the GH6 has to make up for a $2,500 difference, and as much as it's a bit better in every way, it simply doesn't make up that price difference. In summary, the GH6 is better than its predecessor in almost every single way on paper. In post-production, that certainly stands out, with higher image and video quality at every corner. But in use, the camera's far less pleasant and even counterproductive to use. And then there's the price. Micro Four Thirds is supposed to be a budget level camera. It's a smaller sensor, therefore smaller lenses, therefore a smaller price tag. But at the same price as an S35 cinema camera and more expensive than some full frame alternatives from Panasonic's competitors, I simply don't think this camera has any ground to stand on. Maybe in a few years if it saturates the second hand market and drops in price, you might find a home for it. But to me, it will always be outdone by its older brother, the GH5. That's all from me, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that, please hit the thumbs up button, it really helps out, especially for a smaller channel such as this one. And if you have any experience with the GH6, or any Micro Four Thirds camera for that, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. Now I'll leave you with some stills, and if you like them, you can see more on my social medias, and yes, that's a second plug in one video. <laughs>